recorded. So this session today is a follow-up from the uh, State of Ocean Deoxygenation in Canada workshop that took place virtually on June 20, 2022. And that was organized by MIOPAR ONC funded project Oxynet. Um, the objective of that workshop was to provide an opportunity for members of the Canadian marine scientific community to identify what is currently known about ocean deoxygenation in Canada and discuss challenges in relation to deoxygenation research in Canadian water. The workshop, a workshop summary was produced and distributed to the workshop attendees and was made available to you uh, prior to today's meeting. Today's workshop is a follow-up from this first workshop. So we'll provide an overview of the current situation in Canada, provide an overview and some support to the um, um, ocean deoxygenation community in Canada to get organized and start to work in a coordinated way at the national level. Um, I'm going to let uh, Dr. Gwenea Shayu take on the lead of this session. Uh, Dr. Chayou is professor at Institut des Sciences de la Mer de Rimouski. She is the Canada's chairs holder in Géochimie des Eaux Hydro Hydro <laughs> French and English, but too much. Uh, and she is also on Miopar Research Program Management Committee. Um, I am going to put quickly the link for the retro, uh, easy retro. Um, board in the chat box in a minute so you guys can have the link and contribute to the board as we go along with this session. Gwenelle, if you want to take the lead, please. Yeah, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks you to be here today. Thank Isa for the introduction and uh, your help in preparing this session dedicated to ocean deoxygenation in Canada. So, um, Ocean deoxygenation is a global phenomenon. This is the, the reduction of oxygen in open and coastal oceans. The ocean oxygen content has declined by around 2% in the middle of the 20th century. And the volume of ocean water completely depleted of oxygen has quadrupled over the past 60 years. Rising global ocean temperatures continental input of nutrients and associated primary production, and changes in ocean circulation are some of the factors leading to oxygen depletion in the ocean. But the loss of oxygen will have severe impact, local or regional impact, on marine biodiversity and on the functioning of the ocean ecosystems. Much remains unknown as the long-term human health, social, and economic consequences of the ocean oxygen loss. So what is currently happening in Canada? Today, we would like to share with you the state of uh, deoxygenation in our ocean from the East Coast to the West Coast. Several of us have already met last June in a workshop organized in the Oxynet Project Framework we had evoked the need to organize and structure a group to share information, results, and practices, and the need to disseminate and alert Canadians to this issue. So we will first look at what is happening at the international uh, with the professor uh, Marie-Laure Grégoire. She is the co-president of an UNESCO endorsed program, the GON program. And after Marilor's presentation, we will go in, uh, into smaller groups to discuss setting up a community of practice on deoxygenation in Canada or a sort of community of practice. We invite you to share your ideas with us uh, during this time. But if you need more time, and because we are very curious of, uh, of what do you think, and we want to respond as much as possible to the need, to our need, uh, we invite you to share your ID as an easy retro board by following this link. And I suppose uh, you have the link also in an email this month. You received the link this morning in the email and in a chat. So, and without further ado, I will invite Mathilde to present the situation in the Saint Lawrence system. 
Donc, Mathilde, je vais me enlever mon, mon partage d'écran puis je vais te laisser la place. Pour, euh, Perfect. Thank you, Quinn. Um, OK. So, I think you see my slides. Is it black? I see just black. OK. It's good. <laughs> so, um, thank you very much, Gwen, for asking me to present uh, what is happening in terms of deoxygenation in Eastern Canada. I will talk a bit more, of course, uh, about of the St. Lawrence estuary because this is the, the system that I am studying at Miguel University, where I'm a PhD student working with uh, Alfonso Mucci and Carolina Dufour. Um, but I also wanted to say a little bit about other systems that people are studying right now. So the St. Lawrence estuary is located here, as most of you know, and this is the St. Lawrence Gulf, and we've seen oxygen concentrations going down there. But if I didn't forget any, which is very possible, so please, at the end, <laughs> you can let us know. But I know that some people are also studying, for example, hypoxia in the Bedford Basin, uh, close to Halifax. Uh, and I'll come back to what is happening also uh, on the Scotian shelf in general. And also some people at Dalhousie are studying oxygen uptake in the Labrador Sea, which is not necessarily, um, it's different because it's not interesting in terms of very low oxygen concentrations that would have a strong impact now, but more in terms of understanding the drivers of uh, oxygen absorption by, by the ocean. So about the St. Lawrence estuary, I'm showing here a time series that goes from the 1930s to this year, last year actually, uh, and I'm showing the oxygen concentrations in micromole per kilo. And this is the combination of uh, data that was taken by many people and just the recent data was uh, observed by these three teams here. And what we can see is that it's been going down, but also that we observed a really dramatic decline uh, in 2020 and 2021 compared to a relatively stable uh, concentration that we had been observing in the last two decades. Um, so, uh, so at this point, we reached values of 35 micromole per kilo. So this is very, very low, below the hypoxic values that we already had. And we expect very strong consequences, consequences on the ecosystems. And this is accompanied also by an increase in the uh, extent, the aerial extent of the hypoxic zone. As you can see here, this is just a, like a, an estimate, but when it was about, so, so we had about 1300 uh, kilometers square in the early like 2000 or in late 1990s, we now have almost 10 times more um, kilometers square uh, of hypoxic, uh, hypoxic waters. And it's just, to show a little bit, let's say like the orange is what we had before, and now we we extended into the Gulf and even also other regions here because we have some um, channels. And at the end of these channels, we're starting to see hypoxia also in the other channels in the Central Ancestry. So what is causing this? I, mean, I guess like most of people here know, but just for the other ones, <laughs> just like a quick re recap, uh, there are two things that are happening. The first one is that we have a local effect, uh, which is eutrophication. So because of all the nutrient export to the St. Lawrence River and the other rivers on the different coasts of the St. Lawrence, um, we have uh, algae blooms and then this leads to eutrophication of the bottom waters. And we also have an increase in the water temperature, which will increase the biological activity and also deplete oxygen. And the second thing that is happening is more of an external cause related to to the climate and it's the fact that we have so the waters that enter the, the the system here are a mix of Labrador current and Gulf Stream waters and the Labrador current waters are cold and they are well oxygenated while the Gulf Stream waters are warmer and they can hold less oxygen so if we have more Gulf Stream waters uh, to the years we have lower oxygen concentrations and this is what we are observing and here I'm showing a transect um, along that pink line here, along the, the Laurentian Channel, in 2021, of the amount, the fraction of Labrador current waters and Gulf Stream waters. So blue means that it's very low and red is uh, 100%. So what we can see is that we reach a point where we have just no more Labrador waters entering the system. And we have 
100% Gulfstream waters. Um, and this fits with a long term observation, like trend. Well, not really long term, but like with a trend in the amount of Gulfstream versus Labrador current waters that is entering the system. And uh, all the way to that point in 2021 when we reached like a fraction of zero. And you can see that it was like pretty stable. And then in 2008, it started to, to decrease. And okay, so what's interesting actually is that the, the causes in the, the oxygen decline change with time. So here the pink bar is showing the observed deoxygenation. And on the uh, right, you have the different causes that are contributing to this change. And in from 1970 to late 1990s, most of the um, of the decline was due to these like uh, green and orange <laughs> um, bars, which are uh, related to eutrophication or the increase in water temperature locally, or like so biogeochemical process. So all the way to, to early 2000s, it was eutrophication and biogeochemical changes that were causing the the decline. But more recently, so from 2008, now it's the blue, which is the this change in the ratio of Gulfstream and Labrador current waters, which is dominating. So it's really changes in the circulation in the North Atlantic that are driving this change. All right, so this is a bit of an overview and like the same also for 2018 to 2021, which is like the new results. It's really the what is happening in the North Atlantic that is driving the change. So this is a bit the, the state for the St. Lawrence estuary. But I also wanted to say that what is maybe like for the future in terms of studying uh, deoxygenation um, in this area. So there is a new uh, coupled physical biogeochemical model that is uh, now used at DFO, uh, mainly by Diane Lavoie. And you can see the, the paper that they published where they present the the, the model and I think now they are starting to, to analyze it more and more. So that will be very interesting. And uh, I believe also that uh, at Dalhousie University, Katia Fennell's group, they have also a, a biogeochemical model of about the same area, but extending, ext extending a bit more offshore. They are looking mostly at carbon, I think, but uh, also there are possibilities to look at oxygen. So this is for the modeling side. And in terms of observations, um, I just wrote here that my supervisor is retiring, so we'll need new people to continue to look at, to, to do observations. I didn't mention, okay, so like what is still going on, but Gwenael is going at sea to measure these things. Um, and I just also wanted to mention the T-Rex experiment, which is not directly looking at oxygen, but it's kind of related to it because what they did is they released tracers in the St. Lawrence system, and they are going to go back. Well, they already went back, but I guess they're going to go again and try to see how long it takes for the tracer to go to different locations and to understand better the circulation of the area. And this is by a team led by Doug Wallace at Dalhousie University for the deep part of the experiment. And there is another part of the experiment that is looking at the shallow waters, but this is less related to oxygen, and this is at UCAR. And I also, so yes, and finally, uh, I mentioned it already at, at the beginning, but there is a team at Dalhousie University and um, Daria Tamanchuk is really um, studying that. It's, and it's more about oxygen uptake in the Labrador Sea. And the, the, um, the purpose of all of this is to say that the ocean models currently, like the, the global climate models do not reproduce the oxygen trends that we observe, they really underestimate the trends. And so it's really important to understand what processes are not resolved in these models and what processes we are missing. So that's it. Merci, Mathilde. Thank you very much, Mathilde. Uh, we have time for only one question, if you have a question for Mathilde for the presentation on the Saturn system. Oh, Marjolaine, you can go ahead. Really, hi. Uh, thank you, Mathilde. I was just wondering about um, the causes uh, that you, you highlight for the dehydrogenation. So you have like temperature change and water mass changes, but 
I thought they were related to each other. So how did uh, you say yes. Sorry, I went a bit fast, but uh, yes, they, they happen uh, for the same reason because the, the proportion of the water mass is, is changing. But we set apart like the the impact of the the temperature increase on biological activity. So we attribute that. So we we put that into the category of like biogeochemical changes. So it's really just because the water is warmer, there is more uh, biological biological activity and more oxygen consumption. Thank you. Thank you, Mathilde. Thank you, Marjolaine, for your question. For any other question, uh, you can use the chat or write to meet Mathilde in the get a -ton in uh, after the, 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 the session. And uh, for your next speaker, I will invite uh, Hailey Dosser. Uh, so Hailey is a, in the new Glider Program Scientist at BFO. <laughs> Congratulations, Hailey, for the position. And she will talk about the situation in the West Coast. Okay, thanks, Gwen. Um, can everyone see my slides? Hopefully. Yes. yes. Thumbs up. Great. Okay. So I'm going to give a brief overview for the West Coast of Canada, and this is focused on ongoing and very recent projects. And I've put the person who provided the update on the slide, but these are all collaborative projects. So please make sure to reach out for more information uh, if you're interested in any of them. So I wanted to start with a little bit of context for the West Coast and the Northeast Pacific Ocean. Um, we're in an area where we're seeing an expansion of the low oxygen waters and the oxygen minimum zone in the Northeast Pacific Ocean. We're also seeing some long-term downward trends in oxygen on certain isopycnals that are ventilated in the Western Pacific, and that's due to reductions in both that ventilation and the shallow overturning circulation. We've seen an increase in the frequency and severity of marine heat waves. And in combination with the seasonal upwelling of naturally low oxygen waters onto the continental shelf, um, we're seeing some pretty severe impacts in coastal waters, including uh, increases in ocean acidification and low oxygen events. And as a result of all of these things, we're seeing the beginnings of changes in species distribution and ecosystem organization. And I'll just point out, um, we've got Vancouver Island, we've got a narrow continental shelf that then widens north of Vancouver Island, and we've got some uh, estuaries, including um, the Salish Sea, Strait of Georgia, and Puget Sound. Okay. So in response to some of these uh, pretty severe impacts on the West Coast, there is this update here from Jim Christian and Wiley Evans about the development of fisheries and aquaculture ocean acidification and anti-poxia action plan. So this was uh, through the province of British Columbia. This action plan is now complete and is either in the hands of the provincial government or soon to be in the hands of government leadership. And the goal of this was to determine the state of knowledge related to ocean acidification and hypoxia in BC's coastal waters. So that's one big program going on. Another major program right now is the PRODIGY, which stands for Pacific Rim Ocean Data Mobilization and Technology. This was an NSERC CREATE program. It's now in year two of six. And thanks to Philippe Tortel for this update. So this program is based on a Canadian Chile research and training partnership. And it's focused on looking at deoxygenation in fjords. And those studies include a fieldwork component as well. So we've got some maps on the right here showing some of the Chilean and British Columbian fjords. And BC uh, is characterized by numerous fjords along the West Coast. OK. Also related to fjords, we've got some work. Uh, this update is from Laura Bianucci and Jen Jackson, and this is for Clequot Sound Fjords and Hypoxia. So this work is meant to support ongoing physical and biogeochemical modeling efforts for the west coast of Vancouver Island. And there's uh, an es establishment of a monitoring program for Clequot Sound and for um, specifically the fjords. So this is a collaboration between DFO, First Nations, Ocean Networks Canada, and the Nature Trust of BC. And the motivation for this, if you look at that figure on the right, you can see some measurements uh, through time from Fjord. 
and we've got depth and then the color in the top panel is dissolved oxygen and that white dashed line shows the level of hypoxia and in some of these fjords we see hypoxia as shallow as 12 meters and there's a paper there Rosen et al 2022 with more information on that okay we also have some modeling efforts to look at the impact of sewage outfall so this is a project funded by King County in Washington State, and there are three different models involved um, and three different Salish Sea modeling groups looking at the role of sewage outfalls in deoxygenation in Puget Sound, which is down here in Washington State. So we've got an FECOM, ROMS, and NEMO model. And uh, the NEMO model is Salish Seacast run by Susan Allen, and that is the um, model domain for that shown on the right there. Okay, going a bit bigger picture with modeling work, uh, Ember Holdsworth and collaborators has, have been looking at extreme conditions in the recent past for the Northeastern Pacific. And that's using this NEMO model, NEMO version 3.6. So that model domain is shown on the right there. And it includes biogeochemistry and tides and is quite high resolution. And this work is focused on characterizing extremes for bottom water, looking at regions defined by clustering on temperature, depth, aragonite saturation state, and apparent oxygen utilization, as well as exploring teleconnections for hypoxia. Okay, now moving a bit towards the biological impacts of deoxygenation and some of the work in that area, um, we've got an update from Cherise Dupre. Dup Cherise Dupreez on deep sea ecology program work. So the deep sea ecology program uh, has been established and is now doing resurveying work for 30 different monitoring sites uh, on seamounts where part of the seamount is located within the oxygen minimum zone waters. So the goal here is to take a look at how the rapid deoxygenation happening in that region is impacting cold water corals, sponges, and deep sea animals. This was based on a paper, Ross et al. 2020, that showed 60 year trends for declines in oxygen. And based on that, the prediction is that in the next century, a lot of these different deep sea animals are going to start feeling pretty serious compound effects um, with impacts to their distribution, respiration, metabolism, growth, dissolution, feeding behavior, reproduction, basically everything and ultimately their survival. We've also got some really nice uh, species distribution modeling for groundfish going on. This is an update from Patrick Thompson. Um, and this was for modeling of 34 different groundfish species. Uh, the figure on the right here shows projected species richness change versus depth with the color showing the projected increase in warming. And overall, the results here show that warming is going to push species into deeper water. So you get this decrease in species rich, richness near the surface, but those species are limited in how deep they can go by the presence of hypoxic uh, deep water, deeper than about 600 meters. So they're sort of trapped in an increasingly narrow band of depth. Okay, we also have some work coming out right now for Pacific halibut habitat. Um, this is a figure from a paper by Anna Franco et al. from this year. And this shows future projections of ocean deoxygenation and warming that are expected to reduce the suitable habitat available for Pacific halibut um, with an overall shift northward of about five degrees in what would be considered suitable habitat. And I'll specifically point to the middle uh, row here. So that shows oxygen. On the left is the summer mean for 94 to 2007. Then there's the future projection centered around 2100. And this right panel shows the difference between the two. And you can see from those red colors and the values that that is quite a significant change in oxygen, pretty dramatic. Uh, there's also been a recent paper from Thompson et al. 2022, looking at the response of Pacific halibut to future climate change scenarios. Okay. And then I just wanted to end by talking a little bit about a low oxygen event that was observed in the shelf uh, for summer 2022, because it's not just 
projections of future changes, we are actually already seeing pretty extreme deoxygenation events. So we had this low oxygen event in summer 20, oh, sorry, summer 2021. Uh, so the figure here is from Tatiana Ross, and it shows the west coast of Vancouver Island uh, from late summer into fall of 2021. And we have data from both the DFO line P and La Perouse time series. So those are those circles, as well as a couple of our um, sea-proof ocean gliders and uh, the Folger Deep, Folger Deep Mooring, I think, which is the little star. And basically, if you look at the colors, red shows the hypoxic waters. And so using this combined data set, we were able to track the progression of this low oxygen event through time uh, last year during the summer. And so there's a manuscript uh, by Anna Franco et al on that, which is currently under review um, with GRL. And then in my last 30 seconds, I'm just gonna talk a bit about my own work with the, the Sea Ocean Glider Group. We have a fleet of 10 ocean gliders. Uh, we have oxygen sensors on 18 BGC Argo floats. So the map on the right here shows the float trajectories and then these straight lines are, are our glider lines. And we're trying to maintain, like continually occupy um, both line P and the Calvert line, hopefully adding a third line this year. Uh, we're about to release a glider-based fully, correct, fully corrected oxygen product that I've been putting together. And you can see an example of what that data looks like and can be used for in the plot in the bottom right that shows a glider mission during that low oxygen event in summer 2021, where the glider crossed the shelf and was able to observe uh, in red those very low hypoxic waters. And I will stop there. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you, Ale. It's uh, very impressive the, the effort uh, put in it's, uh, over the, the, the last year in, uh, in the West Coast. So do you have a question for Hele? We have time for one or just one short question. Oh, Mathilde. Uh, yeah, sorry, if there is no question, I, I could maybe ask one. I was wondering what is the plan with the, with the gliders and the, the Argo floats? I saw like, so there is like this portion of the shell, but what is the long-term plan in mm -hmm. terms of region to cover? Yeah, good question. So for the gliders, we're hoping to do a few things. We're hoping to extend our glider line that currently runs across the shelf north of Vancouver Island. And we want to extend that um, fully offshore uh, into like the deep open ocean waters. And then we're also hoping to add another glider line just so we get kind of evenly spaced transects uh, both across the shelf and then out into the open ocean. And uh, I'm personally interested in that because I think it'll provide the opportunity to get an early warning for some of these extreme events. So thank you, Eileen. So do not hesitate to use the chat to ask your question or to add some comment. And uh, yes, we will go ahead with the, our next speaker. And we are very pleased to have uh, Professor Marie-Laure Grégoire today. Marie-Laure is the co-president of the GON program. She is a professor at uh, the Université de Liège at the Department of Atmospheric Geography and Océanographie. So, um, bonjour Marie-Laure, oui, on voit ton, bien ton, ton écran, je ne te vois pas par contre. Ah, euh, si, j'ai allumé la caméra. Ah, super, je te laisse okay. aller, merci Marie-Laure. Ok, so, thank you Gwenaël, thank you for inviting me uh, today to speak uh, at the Meopar Networks. Uh, so, I'm Marie-Laure Grégoire from the Liège University in Belgium and I am currently co-chairing the Global Ocean Oxygen Network from IOC uh, UNESCO. And uh, I'm also the co PI of the Global Ocean Oxygen Decade uh, program. Uh, so that's a program that has been endorsed by the UN Decade. Uh, so I'm co chairing the GON and the GOOD. Uh, GOOD is the program with Andreas and Schlies from GMR. And uh, Kirsten Nissansi is the IOC UNESCO uh, project officer. So first, just a few words about the GON network. So GON is an international network of scientists that has been launched in 2016 
Uh, and so here you can see uh, most the members of the network, not all of them, but a large part of them. And so here you can see Andreas, you can see myself, sorry. And you can see so all the people uh, yeah, that you probably know. Uh, so this Gold Group, so the Global Ocean Oxygen Network, we have submitted a program on ocean deoxygenation in the frame of the UN decade uh, call for program. And so we had been endorsed. And so we have this Global Ocean Oxygen Decade program uh, that uh, has the aim to build a community around ocean deoxygenation. So it's really to, to build a network of scientists with different projects and also with stakeholders. So first I will briefly, before speaking about good, because here in my talk, what I would like to uh, present to you is what are the main uh, scientific axes that we have in good. But before going there, I would like just to make an overview of ocean deoxygenation very briefly, because I know that you already know a lot about, about ocean deoxygenation. So here it's a map that shows you the distribution of low oxygen areas in the coastal in red, and also in the open ocean, you can see the blue dots. And so as you know, you have many sites along the coast. Uh, it has been, uh, the inventory is more than 500 coastal sites. And then as concerned the volume, we have several million of cubic kilometers of waters where the oxygen concentration is lower than two milligrams per liter. So in the open ocean, uh, the mechanism uh, of deoxygenation, so first, what the status of deoxygenation is as Gwendolyn has mentioned before, we have uh, a decrease of more or less one up to 2% of the oxygen inventory since 1960, which amount to several billions of tons of oxygen. So that's not nothing. Uh, these changes, you can see here the distribution of changes in this uh, map here on the right. And so in red, you can see the region of the world ocean where the oxygen concentration, the oxygen inventory is decreasing. So you see that this decrease is not uniform. You have a region in the world ocean where the decrease is more important. And that's the case in particular in the tropical and North Pacific and also in the Southern Ocean and in the South Atlantic. The Arctic Ocean is also, con is also uh, uh, a red pulse. Uh, as concerned, the vertical distribution is not homogeneous as well, and the decrease is mainly uh, localized between 100 and 300 meters. Uh, you also have to know if we look at the oxygen budget, uh, if we compare the atmospheric oxygen budget with the ocean oxygen budget, we see big differences as concerned the oxygen inventory. And the oxygen inventory of the ocean is about only 0.6% of that in the atmosphere. So that's the first characteristics. And the other characteristic is that no, since 1960, more or less, the ocean and the atmosphere are not in equilibrium anymore, but you have a release of oxygen from the ocean to the atmosphere. Um, and this makes that the ocean oxygen is decreasing. So more or less what governs the budget, the whole budget of the ocean oxygen, you have more or less a balance of uh, the photosynthesis and the respiration over the ocean. You only, you only have a very small imbalance that will be buried in the sediment and which will be considered as an oxygen source for the ocean. And then of course you have the exchanges with the atmosphere. And this exchanges with the atmosphere has been perturbed due to the warming, okay? but also due to the change in the circulation. So if we want to explain why we have this change in the ox ocean oxygen content, we uh, have shown that uh, more or less 15% is due to a change in solubility, so a direct change, uh, a direct consequence of warming. But for the remaining part, the 85% remaining part, it has been shown that this is due to a reduction of the ventilation of the ocean and notably due to, uh, to a, a slowdown of the meridional overturning circulation that reduce the amount of oxygen that will go from the atmosphere to the ocean. On the top of that, of course, we also have the natural variability, which can also be very important. And so to differentiate what are the consequences of the climate warming due to the humans and to the natural variability, we need to have models in order to really understand what are the mechanisms 
uh, the relative importance of this mechanism. For the coastal ocean, we also have an increase of the oxygen of the oxygen uh, deficiency and the number of hypoxic sites. So this is a map uh, of that has been produced uh, ten years ago, more or less, by Diras and Rosenberg. Um, this shows the number of sites where deoxygenation with hypoxia has been found once. Okay, and so you see that there is a big increase. Uh, uh, starting in 1960 due to eutrophication mainly, so the large river inputs of nutrients that cause a hypoxia on the bottom and which uh, threaten the uh, animals that live on the bottom and that cannot escape to hypoxia. Of course, on the top of that, we also have the impact of warming uh, due to the change in solubility and also to the change on the extension of the stratification periods. Okay, so no good. So what do we have in good? So good, the program that we have in the decade, uh, the main topics that we want to investigate is deoxygenation and ocean life, deoxygenation and water quality and the climate system, deoxygenation and ecosystem services, deoxygenation and cost stressors, economic consequences, what are the causes and what are the consequences of deoxygenation? What could be the mitigation approach and then we also have a topic on modeling and mapping oxygen. And then, of course, capacity building is very important. I will try to illustrate very briefly this different topic to show you example of uh, the research that is performed in the different topics. So as concerned deoxygenation and life, so it's an important question to know what's the impact of deoxygenation on biodiversity. And especially in connection with the definition of planetary boundaries associated to deoxygenation, what is the rate of deoxygenation that would compromise uh, the stability of the biodiversity? And so here this slide show you on the right, on the left, sorry, uh, the, 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 the fact that oxygenation on the Earth has been often uh, associated to an increase in biodiversity. And on the right is the reverse. You see deoxygenation and decrease in biodiversity. So first on the left, so you see here the atmospheric oxygen content and on the first image and on the bottom, you see also the change in the biodiversity uh, during the time, during the ages, the geological ages. And so you can see that with the different deoxygenation events. So here you have, of course, the grid oxygenation event and here you have all the oxygenation events that occur after this great oxygenation events. And you can see that when you have this threshold of increase of oxygen, it's also very often associated to an increase in biodiversity in parallel. And conversely, if we look at the deoxygenation events, so when we had uh, the, the, the ocean anoxic event in the ocean, this ocean anoxic event in the ocean has been very often uh, associated to biodiversity crisis. They have found that for four of these deoxygenation events have been associated to biodiversity crisis. So then the link uh, of deoxygenation and biogeochemistry and water quality. So what are the main questions? So an example of very important question. So here we show you the, uh, the cycle, the budget, of fixed nitrogen. So fixed nitrogen is mainly nitrate and ammonium. That's a nitrogen that can be fixed directly by, by phytoplankton. And so here you see the different numbers of the budgets in a teragram of nitrogen per year. In the blue, you see the natural, if I may say, budget. And in the red, you see the perturbation due to the human activities. And so you see the increase of the riverine inputs, and you see also the increase of the atmospheric inputs. So that's what the numbers that you can find in the literature. So you have an input due to the atmospheric deposition of fixed nitrogen to the ocean, to the reef from the rivers. You also have an input due to the nitrogen fixation by nitrogen fixers in the ocean. But you also have a release of fixed nitrogen due to denitrification. And the question is, of course, to know if you have a balance between the input and between the sink of fixed nitrogen in the ocean, because that's very important to know the long-term evolution of the primary production. 
Okay, and the question is very pertinent because we have the oxygenation, and we know that if we have the oxygenation, we will have an increase in the denitrification. So you see here the big uncertainty that we have in the estimation of the global denitrification. Okay, and so if you have an increase of the OMZ, uh, oxygen minimum zone, you may have an increase of this denitrification. So you can have a loss of reactive nitrogen, and you can know, you do not know, we still do not know what could be the impact on primary production and on the balance of the rate field of nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. So the question is to know, do we really have an, a balance between the nitrogen fixation and between the denitrification? Can we have a balance in order to stabilize the nitrogen cycle? We know, for instance, that the nitrogen fixation can be increased if we have high amount of phosphorus and iron. And we also know that in region where we have the oxygenation, we have a promotion of release of nitrogen and phosphorus. And so deoxygenation on one end can promote the release of phosphorus and iron, and then can promote nitrogen fixation, but on the other end can also promote the increase of the nitrification. And so the question is really to know will we have a balance between the two if OMZ are expanding. Then I would like to go to the mapping and modeling of the oxygenation. And I would like to refer to a community paper that we have published recently. And this paper has been published in Frontiers almost one year ago. And uh, it's a call of the scientific community in order to build a, glo a global ocean oxygen database and atlas for assessing and predicting the oxygenation and ocean health in the open and coastal ocean. So that's an initiative that we try to promote among the scientific community and you are mostly welcome to contribute in order to build, to build a unique database of ocean oxygen data and from that to build, to build atlas with a map of the oxygen concentration. We have, been a, we have a project, so not a program, a project that has been endorsed, which targets this development of this go to that uh, uh, database and atlas. So the idea of this go to that is really to have uh, single entry points for downloading all the data on oxygen, Twinker, CTD, Argo, Glider, Mori, etc. All of them would be available for one single entry points and being sure that all these data have been flagged with the same transparent quality flagging system as have been submitted to the same quality control procedure which so far is not the case. You still have an heterogeneous quality control procedure and quality flagging would complicate the life of the scientists when you want to download the oxygen data. The idea, of course, is to have this data available not only for the open ocean, but also for the coastal ocean. The coastal ocean is very important because a lot of data remain in local database and are not delivered to the central database. And then from all this data, the idea would be to map different products like the SOCAT product, if you know, for CO2. It would be the same for oxygen. And so here you see the go to that one, two, three. And this different level of product is just due to the different type of data that you will merge in the atlas, in the mapping. So for instance, this one, the go to that one, will only be based on Winkler. The other one would merge Winkler and CTD, and then we cross CTD and Argo, et cetera. So that's the different level that we would like to have. And so this database and Atlas would also be interacting with a, a community of users. That's really the spirit of the decade. Then uh, ecosystem services, the oxygenation and ecosystem services. So you know probably that uh, the oxygenation can impact, for instance, corals. And you have here the work by Andrew Atrey, and you see that a uh, picture of coral in a well oxygenated environment, in a poor oxygenated environment. And you can also see here the coral reef in, a, in, a, in, in mauve here per region. And you have in superposition of the hypoxia site, that it's the map that I showed you before, prepared by Diaz and Rosenberg. And you can see that we have overlapping with in some region which, from, which uh, threaten uh, the preservation of the corals and of biodiversity. Multiple stressors, so we are really interacting with the 
a similar program on ocean acidification in the frame of goods. It's, uh, we have interaction with the ORS program, which is uh, ocean acidification, because that's very important. We are already in a multiple stressor world. And so here you have a map that shows the projection in the 8.5 scenario at the, at the end of the, uh, is the change uh, uh, of, uh, at the end of this century compared to the 1990s. And you see here the variation of the different stressor temperature, pH, uh, primary production, oxygen. And so here you see the different oxygen zones. So it's the decrease uh, of 20 micromole and here decrease of 50 micromole. And you can see that you have an overlapping of region uh, where you have multiple stressors that will act on the biological resources of the community and on the biogeochemical cycles. So this multiple stressor is, is really important. It's really the approach that we have to follow. So, what could be the uh, the synergetic uh, uh, the, the, or the antagonist? What could be the the impact of this multiple stressor warming, the oxygenation, acidification, and change of the flux of uh, food to the benthic system, for instance? Okay, then uh, the societal consequences, and then I will have uh, it's one of my last slides. Uh, you have some studies that uh, from uh, William Schoen, he's from Canada, I guess. And you see that uh, he projects the impact of the oxygenation on the fisheries. And he showed that in a low oxygen world and in a warming world, we will have a decrease in the size of the fishes, as you can see here. And this will, of course, decrease the service, the food provisioning services that we will have for the society. Okay, so then we also, I would like also to make your attention on the uh, 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 report that has been published recently, uh, two years ago, maybe already three years ago by IUCN about ocean deoxygenation. And there you have a very nice synthesis, a very complete synthesis of the impact of deoxygenation on the ocean, economic impact and uh, impact in different regions. So that's uh, physics, et cetera. So that's really a, a very nice overview of deoxygenation. I really invite you to refer to this, to this uh, IUCN uh, report. Capacity building. Uh, we are organizing so capacity building activities. And for instance, in 2023, we will have a summer school uh, in, in Chile, okay, here in uh, Coquimbo in Chile, November 2023. It's still time to, uh, to apply to the summer school. The website is open. I guess that it's time until the end of November. So it's, 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 it's time to apply. And then I would like also to mention this uh, capacity building initiative is a participation of scientists to, uh, uh, to put on cruises, which are leisure cruises to which scientists can participate, can take observations. So you see here, for instance, the different transects that have been followed by the Ponan crews, and some of them were, uh, were organized in the Arctic Ocean here, you see. And uh, during that cruise, a scientist can take observation and also communicate with the, with the public that the people are on the, on the boat uh, by making scientific presentation, et cetera. Okay, and then that's it, it, it just to mention that we had a, a conference in Liège in May. Uh, it was in hybrid mode, so now it's finished, but there is a special issue to which you are invited to contribute. It's in biogeoscience, and this special issue is open to anyone who work on deoxygenation. It's open until August 2023. And so I just thank you for, for your attention. Merci, Marie-Laure. So do you have uh, questions for Marie-Laure? We have time, so. I'm sure there, there are several people around the table who could contribute to, to the database. <laughs> we have a lot of data in the West and in the East Coast. So no question? Oh, Marjolaine. Or is it an old hand or is it a new? No, a new one. A new uh, one. Just, just wondering, I, I haven't heard that much about uh, the, the go to the data, go to the initiative. And I'm, I'm just wondering um, who's 
who's asked to contribute to contribute to the to the database is it on a volunteer is it like volunteer people that just submit their data or are people uh, do people receive some financial support so that they can uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a very good question, and that's of course a, a tricky question. So no, what we we the the project has been endorsed by the UN decade, and we try to receive support, funding support to implement this uh, go to that uh, initiative. Uh, so tap, so far, it's just our good willingness, I would say. Uh, so we we but uh, it's it's really uh, taking form. So we have built a steering committee. And we have uh, engaged people from IODE, for instance, from the NOAA, of course, from Argo. So we try really to engage a community in the steering committee. And then uh, the Tata contributors. So we would like to, to also to link with them. But uh, yeah, so that's uh, something that will uh, appear progressively when we have built the structure of this database. So what we are doing also is to uh, we organize hackathon. So we have one in Brest in December here, in the second of December, and we already had one uh, in the frame of the G7 uh, meeting in London. And during this hackathon, we collect data sets from everywhere, and the data scientists try to to use this data set to uniformize this data set, etc. So so far, that's how we we work, and we really try to raise interest in order to receive a financial support to build really this database and to have someone who can call the people and who can collect all the data sets from the community. Okay, and just for uh, maybe uh, my better understanding, um, so the go to date initiative is like an international initiative while the CU's initiative is like more like a Canadian thing. How, how these two are linked, are they linked together or? Or the two separate the CUs? Uh, CUs, I'm not sure it's Canadian Integrated Observatory. Okay. Probably Ocean something. <laughs> so that's very good to know. So what we need to, to know is to, to link with, in fact, what we, we, we would like to do with this go to that is to link with the national initiative. So at the scale of the national, because the idea is really that the national data center collect the data from the scientists. And then via IOD, we would like to collect to connect with this national data center. So it's not doing the work of the national data center. We really hope that the national data center can do the work. And we would like to agree uh, with the scientific community on a uniform data quality control and flagging to communicate that to the national data center for allowing them to implement that and to receive the data from the scientists and then to, to go to go to that. It's different levels, but uh, really hope that it can work like that. So it's, uh, but first what we have to do is to, we have built this uh, go to that steering committee. If you know someone in Canada, I'm not sure that we have someone from Canada, but if you know someone who is really implied in this data quality control and flagging procedure, we can link with this person and to invite this person in the steering committee, because the idea afterwards would be ready to, uh, to agree on a common uh, way of working and then to, to recommend this way of working to the National Data Center afterwards. Yes. Thank you. Hello. Oh, you are. There we go. Uh, just a quick related question um, for the GoToDat database. Um, as the process continues, is there some way that I can keep up to date with what's going on or get updates about it happening? Y yeah. So yes. Yeah, so we have different mailing lists, and there is one where um, where. You know, we have the good newsletter, so you can also, the good newsletter, you can also ask to be, to receive this newsletter. It's uh, each three months and we receive the news from good. Uh, and in this good news, you will have information about this go to that project. Uh, but I, I have to say, I know that there is this good new newsletters. I'm not sure that we will have the same uh, kind of uh, newsletter for the go to that it would be uh, embedded into the good newsletter. Okay. So if you're interested, just uh, 
yeah, so you can go on the good website and you can ask to be uh, to receive this newsletter. If not, you can just send me an email and I will put you into contact with the with the people at IOC who is taking care of the newsletter. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have other question for Marie Laure? And on the gone and or God project in and the UNESCO support activities. No, so I understand, Marie Lau. If we have questions, we can uh, ask you, reach you on by email, and uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, je, je te remercie beaucoup. Je sais qu'il est 20 heures passées en Belgique, alors euh, on va. Non, dis-nous, dis-nous. Ça va. Dis ouais, ça va. <rire> Merci ça beaucoup. Va. Il n'y a pas de souci. Avec plaisir. Eh ben, bonne réunion pour la suite, alors. Hein. Voilà. Merci au beaucoup. Revoir, au revoir à tous. Bonne réunion. Bye. So awesome. So I'll let you lead that, Gwenelle. Thank you. So welcome back. <laughs> so we have a, a few minutes for a quick tour of uh, what happened and what the discussion of in uh, each breakout room. Uh, who wants to go first? But how many how many people? We are only oh, okay. <laughs> We're only 14 people and we end up with only two breakout rooms. Um, and, and that's fine. We were expecting to have people leaving the session. Um, so yeah, maybe going by room, breakout room one versus breakout room two, what's the major outcome of okay? I can go ahead about the on the discussion we, we had in our in our room. Um we talk about uh, the how to join the, the steering committee of the go to date we think it's important at the international level that someone from Canada, uh, probably someone from DFO uh, can go there, uh, or someone from the CIOS organization, just to be sure that uh, we have a, a representation, and we can also coordinate the data formatting in Canada in the in the same um, way that they are doing um, at the international level. So um, I think it's important for the next steps that uh, I, I I don't know who, but maybe it's important for us that someone uh, go uh, in in the steering committee and be how porte parole for, for the group. I think it's important. So we think we talk about that. And um, Doug, come and <laughs> talk about the mitigation. <laughs> so we, we have a, 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 a discussion and a reflection, okay, what can can be done to to, to decrease the, the, the impact of uh, the oxygen depletion, but we were not sure about the, due to the, the, the size of the system, the scale of our system, uh, what can be done. And uh, we asked Amber about the, the, how it works in the DFO, uh, because, because we were not sure, but Marjolaine is here too, so maybe she can help us to understand how and how do you work in the FO if you can, if do you already have a, a, a group to talk about biogeochemistry? So we understand there is a pan Canadian uh, coordination about uh, uh, the, um, the modelization, in, mm -hmm. including the East uh, Atlantic uh, Pacific, but it's depending of person in place. So we conclude that we have place to develop something uh, that can join um, uh, academics and uh, federal uh, researcher, and we have the place to develop something as we want uh, in uh, our image and as we we need. So maybe Amber, Mathilde, Bill, and Taylor, we, do you have something? Uh, I just uh, highlight we did there were some questions about uh, the glider work that oh. Haley talked about for the west coast and what that looks like on the east coast and I wasn't really sure and I thought maybe Haley might have input or uh, Tatiana. Yeah, I can say a few That's words awesome. and then Tatiana can can add. Um, so we do have um, glider groups on the east coast and 
also out of St. John's, Newfoundland. And um, they have, I believe, I, I'm not sure if it's repeat glider lines in the same way that we have glider lines, but they have areas that they are surveying. Yes, they have repeat glider way. lines. They have two yeah. main ones. Okay, yeah. And they have, what, a fleet of eight gliders, I think, something like that. And their data goes back a bit further than ours, actually. So ours goes back to 2019, and they have data going back a bit further. They're right in the process now of looking into doing the processing and correction for the oxygen data. So those data are not quite ready to release, but they're working on it right now. So. And is this data on the laboratory shelf, I guess? Oh, that's a good question. Like, like, or is it in the Gulf? I don't there's two lines, Halifax line and Bonavista Vista line. It, okay. It's yeah. integrated into the AZMP, so they're following okay. AZMP lines. Well, not in hypoxic regions. <laughs> well, could, I, could I just add something uh, quickly? Uh, so during the T-Rex uh, experiment, uh, we, uh, we actually had both the Dalhousie group and the, the Memorial group ran gliders in the Gulf while we were at sea on the Coriolis. So mm. we've got actually probably a pretty exceptional data set uh, in the Gulf. Uh, when we surveyed the whole Gulf, all the way, all the way between, well, almost Calais Strait and uh, and uh, and Rimouski, uh, and gliders were working um, in the Eskimo Channel and also in Southern L Laurentian Channel. So um, we're, we're going to be looking at those data pretty soon. That's unusual to have them running there, but uh, Brad and uh, Nikolai uh, deliberately uh, put, the, uh, put the gliders in for that. Just a to add on to that, since I know a bit about the Dalhousie program from, from past years, there are data from St. Lawrence that go back, but they were primarily missions for um, whale listening, passive acoustics, but they, they did carry an oxygen sensor as well. So there are older data, but when I was saying there's two lines, I mean, there are two regularly maintained lines. There are data um, that were sort of one-off experiments, but there are plenty of data that could be mined um, from the Dalhousie program, from the DFO program, from the Memorial program. And I just want to add that we also have the Viking buoys in the St. Lawrence, which uh, collect some data on, um, on the oxygen. So yeah, we're not within the AZMP, we're like the only region that are that is not focusing on the glider, but on the Viking buoys instead. So I guess it depends on who's leading that thing, but we also have a way to collect data. We have this uh, Viking buoy at Rimouski Station, so where we have low oxygen concentration. So this is something that can be used. So, so I understand there is a lot of uh, individual action, uh, and we that we can merge together just to be uh, stronger and to be. Uh, uh, together at, at the national level, I think it's important uh, for us to organize and to be to have a structure and to know each other. We, I think it's important if we want to develop something, we have to know who is uh, doing what and uh, who wants to be included in the group. So I don't know if Meopa will will have another. Uh, we will. Uh, know that in a uh, in few months i think doug yeah but uh if we if we can uh have the we will have the opportunity maybe to to have some help some support to to organize a group maybe a community of practice of something who can looks like a community of practice um and i think it's important for us to to have someone at the international level too. It's important to have a, a place uh, where we can uh, be there too, all together, uh, because the, the Canada is very, <laughs> uh, very uh, big. So it's, uh, yeah, I, I, and we, we know that we have some problem and we didn't talk about the Arctic Ocean now, but I think uh, Amber talked just a little bit in the room, in the breakout room about the situation or what we can do in the Arctic, but we will have the, the, the problem or the issue probably in a uh, in few uh, years in the Arctic too. Aile, and I saw that Doug want to, to talk too. 
I just had a quick question about something you were saying about needing to get organized in uh, MEOPAR's future funding. One of the major outcomes of our breakout room was talking about the possibility of combining a deoxygenation community with the existing OA community of practice. But one thing that was seen as pretty important was that we would bring um, clear intent and ideally some of our own funding as a community to that effort. And so I was wondering if MIOPAR is refunded, would there be the potential for expanded funding for a joint community of practice? Yeah, I can speak to that. And I'm trying to see if, uh, if Fanny's uh, here. No, she's not. Okay. So um, yeah, so what we wrote into the proposal is that uh, we will call for new proposals for communities of practice, uh, and they can, can propose to continue the same way, Haley, or change their direction, broaden, narrow their scope. Uh, anything is open. I should say, however, I, I think, you know, there's probably going to be a push also for a carbon dioxide removal community of practice. I suspect that's going to happen. So, you know, you could imagine the OA one going that way or going the uh, ox uh, deoxygenation way. Uh, but if it goes both ways at once, it might just become too big, you know. <laughs> but yes, there'll be opportunity, assuming we're funded. Please all cross your fingers. Assuming Neopar is funded, uh, there will be options options to propose new ones or expand or change the direction of its existing ones. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. M Mathilde. Um, sorry, maybe it's on something else. So if if the people other have other things to say about that, I can talk after. <laughs> No, I think you can go away. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, I was also uh, gonna ask about carbon, like the carbon community and carbon absorption by the ocean, if there, if it would be better to to do things together. Because I noticed that today some people are not here, like Katefenel and her group, but they are not working directly on oxygen, but using the same models and tools that we we could be also interested in. Um. So that was one thing. But the other thing, I see that time is is running, and I was like thinking it might be a good idea at the next CMAS conference to have a session on oxygen or maybe more general on biogeochemistry of the ocean. So I think I would make a proposition, but I was wondering who was interested to also uh, help in organizing it. Oh, yes, it's a very good idea. And we need to to see it, uh, to see us, to, to be together in presence. I, I think it's essential to, to talk and to, to know each other. And I think the, 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 the next CMOS, is it in, 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 presence, in presence or is, is it online? It will be hybrid. Hybrid, okay. And then the part in person, I think it's on the West Coast, right? Uh, no, it's in uh, Terre-Neuve, uh, Newfoundland. Yeah, okay, I got confused, okay. And do, do you know when? It's uh, the end of May, beginning of June. Like it goes from like 20 something to beginning of June. Let me double check. It's a very good idea though, Mathilde, very good idea. Okay, well, if some people uh, want to help, like uh, email me maybe. I'll put something together. So I think it's the end of the, the session and uh, I would like to thank all of you uh, to be present and to for the discussion and uh, the the AD you you share with us. So Isa, je vais te laisser la parole pour les les remarques finales.